I want to begin by telling you that there are three promises that God uh, says he will never do. He won't leave you brokenhearted, Psalm 147.3. He won't reject you, John 7.37. And he won't ever leave you or forsake you. So in essence, God is never going to give you up. Never going to let you down. Never going to run around and desert you. Uh, yeah, we are in the Psalms, which are songs. And uh, songs keep coming into my head as I study these. And uh, it's, we have some really good, joyful, praising psalms today to cover so let let's go to the lord oh father god thank you for your word that is full of hope and encouragement lord uh, we worship you we love you we want to honor you with what we say and do and thank you for your word teach it to us now oh god we pray in jesus name amen well, we are in Psalm 89 to begin today, and this is a really long psalm. It's a really great psalm. We're not going to cover every verse of it, uh, but we are going to hit on some of the most important ones. Uh, psalm 89 uh, is titled, Claiming God's Promises in Affliction. So this isn't one of the most happy ones, but it's about half happy and half, where are you, God? Okay. Um, because these psalms are just so real. They come from the heart of the psalmist. This one was written by Ethan. He's an Ezraite. It is a royal praise, lament, psalm, parts of all of those. Uh, Ethan is named a few times in the Old Testament. He is mentioned specifically in 1 Kings 4.31 as a man of great wisdom. He's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 15 as one of the three choir leaders, if you will, uh, that's part of the family that comes from the Levites that are worship leaders. And so uh, with that, uh, let's begin with verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. Now, uh, we've talked about steadfast love a lot, and your version of the Bible may call it unfailing love or loving kindness. It's the word hesed. Uh, it's mentioned 128 times, but do you know what is mentioned, and that's in Psalms, do you know what is mentioned just almost as much? It's in this first verse. I will sing. Sing appears... 124 times in the Psalms. So, it, you know, in some form, sing, sings, singing, sang song, okay? 124 times. And in the passages we're looking at today, we're going to see it pop up quite frequently. So I just want to have you looking at that and remembering that's one of the reasons we begin Mary Ministries with singing, is because we are commanded to in the Bible. And I feel like it just really grabs our hearts, gives us an opportunity to praise God, thank God, and call out in worship to God before we get into his word. So make note of all the times we're going to see it today. I'll start again with verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have sworn, I have made my covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever. And uh, build your throne for all generations. So this is talking about the Davidic covenant, David with I see at the end of it, and the Davidic covenant we first saw in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's what I call the hinge of the Old Testament. 
because David comes about a thousand years after Abraham. And Abraham is the first man that God called and said, I want you to leave the place you're in and go go to a place that I will show you and I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, but through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. So he makes that covenant to Abraham, then a thousand years later, he makes this covenant with David being more specific. From you, you will always have a descendant, it says, on the throne. And, uh, and, and we know that, that Jesus Christ is that ultimate descendant of David, who is on the throne in heaven today, and who will reign forever and ever, fulfilling the Davidic covenant. And we know this because the New Testament begins with Matthew 1.1 saying this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of Abraham, son of David. And then it goes goes into more detail of his um, genealogy. But here we have a reminder, and there are several reminders of this Davidic covenant that he's going to establish through David a king who will last forever. Um, Now we're getting into some verses that are going to talk about holy ones, heavenly beings, and, uh, and hosts. And these are terms that can all be used for angels. And I think in this particular passage that it, they can also be referring to saints and to uh, other beings. But in this passage, they all seem to be referring to angels. How many of you like to hear about angels? How many of you think about angels from time to time? Yeah, okay. Well, let's see what we read here in verse 5. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. And the word there is kados, uh, which means holy one, angel, saint, set apart. Um, Verse 6. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord. And the word there is ben el, which means godlike, mighty warriors or angels, again. And, and truly we know that even the angels who are powerful do not compare to God. I mean, they do not, you know, rank up there with God and Jesus, okay? But they are in heaven. Um, it says in verse 7, a god who is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, so this angelic council in heaven, and awesome above all who are around him. So God, again, is awesome and greater than any who are in his presence or any anywhere. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, O Lord? And, and so that, O oh Lord of hosts, again, that is a military-type term that would speak of an army, but in this case, it's speaking of an angelic force. Uh, I love the Chris song, uh, Tomlin song that talks about the, the God of angel armies. And, and in a lot of translations uh, of the Bible, that he, you know, where he takes that from, it, it's called the Lord of hosts. And so when you see Lord of hosts, you can also think that's the God of angel armies. So he, he is praising God in verse, uh, O Lord, of, Lord God of hosts, who is mightier than you, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. So it, this is going to continue on through verse 37 as, as praise, as a royal Psalm, which means one that's speaking to the of the king or of the ultimate king, the Messiah who came and who is Jesus Christ. Um, so the, there's a lot in that, but we're going to skip down very quickly. 38 through 51, almost to the end, is talking about... Um, Okay, the first half is, hey, you're royal, hey, you're powerful, hey, you're lasting forever, hey, you've done all this good for us. Then we get to the last part, and it's like, um, God, look at verse 
46, for example. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn? Remember how short my time is? Um, verse 49, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old by which your, your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked? So it, it's going from, hey, you're great and you're powerful and you've set this to, but right now we don't even see you. Where are you? So this was probably written by Ethan again, but in the period right after Solomon died, the son of uh, David, and the nation split in, because of a civil war. Not everybody wanted to follow Solomon's son, so there was a civil war, there was discord, there was strife. And so this psalmist is going, but what happened? You've got, we've got all these pr promises, but it doesn't look like, where are you and how long do we have to wait? But it ends with verse 52, saying, But blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. So even in Psalms of Lament, in all the Psalms, except like one or two, there's still a word of praising God. And it usually is at the beginning and the end, but here, after all of this, he's still blessing the Lord forever. And this verse 52 is called a doxology, which is a, a little song of praise. And this is the end of book three. Now, the, the uh, Psalms, remember, are divided into five books that kind of parallel, in a sense, the five books of Moses. So we're moving into book four, which will be Psalms 96 through 106. And it's going to, in some ways, parallel the Old Testament book of Moses, Numbers. Numbers, because we're going to see some wandering in the wilderness and some history there. So with that, we're going to begin Psalm 90, which uh, is titled, Teach Us to Number Our Days. And this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, and it is a praise hymn. Uh, this is the oldest psalm, the oldest psalm. Uh, you know, we often think, or people do in general, that, uh, that the psalms were all written by David. And as we've been going through this, you see, obviously, they're not. He wrote about half of them. And maybe a few more, maybe some of the more anonymous ones. But this is the oldest. It was written by Moses. Now, how many of you can be honest enough to say, I didn't know Moses wrote a psalm. This is news to me. Wow. Okay, y'all all knew it. Great. Uh, <laughs> But uh, this is uh, a psalm uh, that he wrote, and it was put into this, you know, Hebrew songbook. But this was not his first song. His first song is in Exodus chapter 15. He has led the Israelites out of Egypt. They have miraculously crossed the Red Sea. They're on the other side and they are worshiping, and Moses, it's called Moses' Song of Deliverance in Exodus 15. So, what does that tell us about Moses? He was not a one-hit wonder. <laughs> he wasn't even a two-hit wonder, because he has another song in Deuteronomy 32, and that's his longest song, and that's kind of at the end of his writings almost, right before he's getting ready to go up on the mountain, look at the promised land, and then die. And so he, he writes a song there uh, to the next generation, you know, singing it to the next generation who's getting ready to go into the promised land. So uh, with that, we're going to look at this one. And it, it, 90 is a magnificent prayer. He's going to ask God to have mercy on us poor, pitiful humans. Uh, he's going to talk, begin by reflecting on God's eternity, past and future, okay, forever, both directions. And then he's going to move on to human brevity. We're not here that long. And our frailty. We're not that strong. And then he is going to ask God for meaning and significance 
uh, for his people, and he's going to pray for mercy. So let's, let's look at this. Um, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. There's no beginning, there's no end to God. We can't even grasp that in our minds, can we? That he was always here and that there's no beginning and ending because we think of things like, well, it began when God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, no, it began way before that. There was no beginning to God. Um, verse uh, 3 says, You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. So there is a beginning and end to us. We are mortal. We are dust. We are made from dust. We return to dust. And uh, we, we have time limits. God does not. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. So he's saying like a thousand years in the scope of your eternity is nothing. It's so fast. Peter talks about this too in the New Testament in 2 Peter 3, 8. He is writing and he says, but do not overlook this one fact that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So he is talking, Peter is, because people are, being, are, are, are talking like, hey, we thought Jesus was coming back. You told us he's coming back. Where is he? He hasn't come back yet. And he, he's just explaining, hey, he is coming back. In fact, after this verse, he goes on to say, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, but he desires that none should perish and that all would have everlasting life. In other words, he's just giving you a little more time, people. Wake up and jump on board. But his timing is not like ours. Uh, I remember when I was a kid and my mom would say, man, the older you get, the faster time goes. And I didn't understand that as a kid, because uh, it seems like it took forever for Christmas to come every year. And especially those last couple of weeks, time was going so slow. But as an adult, um, a mature adult, time just seems to speed up. It's like, wow, that just happened and now we're getting ready for it again. Or, whoo, days are flying by. Um, but in God's time, it, it's all just, it's moving really quickly. A thousand years, Tim, that's, that's just like a di day. It goes so fast. Verse 10. The years are our, of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. And yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and will fly away. So he's saying, you know, uh, people live 70 years, maybe 80 years, and, and today that's a good span, 70, 80, 90. There are even people making it to 100. Uh, Moses was 120 when he was writing this song. It's thought that it was one of the last uh, that, he, that he wrote. And uh, so he's, he's saying, you know, it's our, our days have, like I said, they are limited on this earth. God's unlimited. Our days are limited. And, and there's, in the span of it, there's going to be some toil and trouble, he says, and soon they're gone, and we fly away. Now, that's a phrase that's used a couple of times in Psalm. It's, it's also used in Psalm 55, 6. And again, when I read these Psalms, I think of songs. I think of, I'll fly away, oh glory. Sing it with me. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. So we, we, we know that when our days here are gone, yeah, we might not actually fly away, but the New Testament tells us that we will have an angel escort. Read Luke 16, that we will have an angel escort to heaven. And so uh, 
when our days are done here, it doesn't mean they're done forever. It means we're just moving on up. To the east side. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> There's another song. <laughs> Y'all are getting ahead of me. <laughs> okay, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. This is, to me, the most important verse in this chapter. Underline it, highlight it, because really that's... Throughout the Psalms, we see a lot of teaching. Hey, teach us your wisdom. Teach us your ways. Teach me, O Lord. Instruct me in this. Boy, when we get to 119, there's going to be a lot of instruction there in that one little chapter. And, um, and so we see this. So he's going to teach us to number our days. Now, how many of you have numbered your days? Yeah, have you figured out? I know somebody has recently figured out how many days they've been alive. But in general, we're not going. I'm on, you know, I don't know, 20,416. We're just going, I'm whatever age. And, and (laughs) And we have trouble keeping up with that sometimes, right? So, but it teaches to number our days so that we get a heart of wisdom. And, and, you know, it seems that, and it should be that, the longer we're on this earth, the more wisdom we have. We want to acquire more wisdom the longer we live. We want to learn and uh, make better decisions the older we get. So he's saying, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. To me, this says this, make every day count. Not count every day. We don't care how many days, but make every day count. How do we make every day count? Well, first of all, every day is a gift from God. Every day that we are alive is a gift from God, so thank Him for that. And give Him a reason to be glad you're still here. You know, keep on serving God, singing to God, worshiping God, loving people, praying for people, and if you're physically able, serving in a way that is useful to the kingdom of God. You know, it's not like, well, I'm going to retire and that's it. I'm sitting in the rocker or the lawn chair or I'm just going to do what I want. Oh, What I want to do till the day I die is serve God in whatever way he can use me. It won't always be maybe what I'm able to do now. I might be sitting in a rocker, but I can still serve God even in that rocker. So so make every day count. Don't count every day, but make every day count as a Christian. As a spouse, if you're married, as a mother or grandmother, grandparent, uh, as a as an aunt, uncle, um, volunteer, employee. If you work, work hard. Set a good example. You know, lazy Christians in the workplace do not do us any favors, do they? Not a bit. So, make every day count. Verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Let the, verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. In other words, God, give us a reason to be doing this. Plant us where you can use us and, and, and help us, Lord, by showing us your favor. Let the favor of the Lord be upon us. Give us what we need to do. Establish that within us. And, and then let's make every day count. Now, let me tell you this, and maybe you didn't know that. There's one more mention of a song of Moses in the Bible. Did you know that? Revelation. Chapter 15, verse 3. This is like getting close to the end 
all right? And they sing the song of Moses, servant of God. And we don't know which song. Was it one of the three we already have looked at? Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 9, or is it a different, different one that maybe he's written since he's been up there? They, they will sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Don't you want to be called that at the end? Mary, the servant of God. That's what I want to be called. And the song of the Lamb, that's Jesus, saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will fear, who will not fear, sorry, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for, the, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So there's a song that we're going to be singing in the end. Moses wrote it. And we're going to be singing about the righteousness and the faithfulness of God as we worship him. All right, Psalm 91. This is one of the most uh, popular psalms. You know, I mean, Psalm 23, far and away, that's most familiar and favorite. But if Psalm 91 is your favorite, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm just curious. Okay, we've got a few hands up here and there. This is one that people will all um, often pray for someone like like a, a child who's going into battle, going into the military, uh, going to college, uh, different kind of battle. Um, but it, it, uh, it is a popular one, and it is a, we, we call it a, abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. We don't know who wrote it. Some people think because it kind of continues what Moses was saying, that Moses wrote it. Others say, no, there's a lot in it that sounds that's, that we see in Psalm 27 and 31 that were both written by David, so David wrote it. We don't know. We don't know who wrote it. But you know what we do know? Every word in this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So regardless of who the human was that penned it, God is the one who inspired it, and it's by his authority that it's in this book. Um, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8 are going to speak of uh, God's character, his care, and his protection. Verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So he who dwells, who lives in the shelter, in the house of, of God, basically, um, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So you've got to be pretty close to somebody to be standing in their shadow, don't you? you you've got to be pretty close. And so that protection, you know, the closer you are to God, the, the, the greater that protection is and feels and you're dwelling right there. But it's real easy to just start slipping away and to go, well, I used to be in the shadow of the Almighty, but now I'm kind of out here in the sun and uh, I don't even know how that happened. It was just probably inch by inch, little by little. And if you're not in the shadow of the Almighty, I suggest that you just move right on up and get right back in there. Uh, dwelling in the shelter of the Most High in the shadow of the Almighty. Where are you living? Where are you living right now? Verse 2. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress... Those two terms we keep seeing over and over as imagery of, of the protection of God. Uh, my, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. It's, he's going to talk about pestilence a couple of times and then plague. And... Um, you know, it's not saying here that these are hard and fast rules. There are godly people who do get sick, who catch COVID-19, 
who catch other plagues or diseases. It's a general principle of God's protection that when we dwell close to him. Um, but we do know something he will always protect us from, and that's eternal you know, damnation. If we are in him, we know that we will live forever with him. And so regardless of what we might face here and now, we know that this is not eternity. This is, this is temporary. Verse 4, he will cover you with his pinions, and that's kind of the, the feathers that are underneath the wings that are a little sharper and more protective. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So he's saying when you're under the protection of God, you are protected supernaturally. You can take on a thousand, you can take on ten thousand, it's saying here, because of God's protection and care. Verse 8, you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. Let me ask you again, where are you dwelling? Where are you living? But because you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be al allowed to befall you, no plague Come near your tent. Um, and then he's going to talk about angels. All right? He says in verse 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Yes, this is one of the places where we get the idea of guardian angels. There's another place in the New Testament. And, and so... He, they're at, the angels are at the command of God. They go where he tells them to go. They do what he tells them to do. Sometimes it's protection. Sometimes it's deliver a message. Um, other kinds of spiritual warfare going on that we don't even see among the angels and what Paul calls the rulers and dominions of, of the uh, spiritual realm. Um, but he is the, his godly angels are at his command to guard us in all our ways. Verse 12, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And so that's why some people pray this, like I said, for a person going into the military, protect my, my loved one as they go into battle. Uh, keep them under the shadow of your wing. Uh, use your pinions to protect them. Uh, command your angels to guard them, and, and, and so forth. But these verses 11 and 12 are quoted in the New Testament. And do you know who quotes them? Satan. Satan quotes these verses. Now, how many of you are shocked by that statement? Yeah, you're going, what? He knows Scripture. And so when Jesus is uh, beginning his ministry, he's been baptized by John the Baptist, and then he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tested. Satan comes around and tests him. You know, hey... Um, you see that, those rocks over there? Man, you've got to be hungry, 40 days of no food. You could just say the word, I bet, and turn those rocks into bread. Jesus answers with Scripture. God has said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He takes Jesus up to the 
pinnacle, let's look at this in Matthew 4. And it's also in, in Luke 4 as well. Luke tells about this too. Matthew 4, 5 says, The devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city, because he's out in the wilderness, takes him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, and here's him quoting scripture, Satan quoting scripture. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But here we have Satan using scripture. Now, there's other times, you know, that he does that, and he, does, he uses it to twist it just a little bit. Like, hey, Jesus, look, you're way up here. It's probably on the uh, corner of the, of the temple wall, which would have been very high up. Not the temple itself, but the temple complex. There's a corner wall there where he was probably up there, and that was the highest point because the valley is right down below it. You know what? Yeah, and he, he knows, Jesus knows scripture. I bet you could just jump off right here and God would catch you and protect you because he's going to send angels. So he's testing him. And believe me, Satan knows scripture and knows how to manipulate it. And sometimes he uses people, false teachers and preachers and false prophets as his instruments. So when we hear scripture, <clears throat> how do we know, well, this is being used correctly or this is, this doesn't sound right to me the way that this person is using this. Sounds like he's manipulating the word of God. Well, that's why you're in Bible study, so you can know the full Word of God, the full counsel of God's Word, understand it, continue reading and studying it, so that you will know the context in which it was written. And, and, and you know, after a while, your, your antennas will start going up and going, uh-uh, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's what the Bible means to be using it in this way. So, so keep in the word of God so you will know. But here, Satan was tempting Jesus using scripture and uh, trying to make it say, oh, do anything you want and God will protect you. And that's not what Psalm 91 is saying. Okay, let's continue on. Um, Verse 13, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Um, again, this doesn't mean just go around stomping on animals. That's not, that's not what it's saying. That would, be mis okay, that would be a way of misusing and twisting scripture, right? But it's saying you're going to have power over, over things of this world that are coming to harm you. You will, God is going to give you his, his protection. Then we get to four, verses 14 through 16, and now it is God speaking. And he gives some conditions of his protection here. 14, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. And when he or she calls to me, I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So God speaks blessings over the one who loves him and knows him. Ver okay, loves him in verse 14, second line, knows, uh, knows he's going to protect us and be with us. It says, I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you. I will honor you. I will satisfy you. And I will show you my salvation. Spend a little time in Psalm 91 this week in prayer. Psalm 92, it is good to praise the Lord 
or it's also called a song for the Sabbath day. This is an anonymous psalm of, of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, the Old Testament Sabbath was the seventh day of the week, and it was a day for rest, no working, no cooking, uh, but there was corporate worship on that day. It was a day of corporate gathering and worship. Uh, in Leviticus 23 calls it a holy convocation. And so um, this song has long been used by Jews as a hymn for the Sabbath day. It's a day when uh, we can focus on not the earthly things, but lift up our hearts to God and worship. Verse 1, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Boy, it, it, that, that's two things that would be real easy for all of us to do. Hop up in the morning and say, I declare the steadfast love of God, that love that doesn't move, that doesn't run away, that doesn't fail. I declare that this morning, um, and I thank you for it, God. And then at the end of the day, thank you, God, for being faithful to your word, to your promises another day, and for giving me another day. Uh, verse 3, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. And at the hands, at the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Okay, so singing is all through this. How many of y'all like to sing? Okay, a lot of people. It's not everybody. It's not everybody, but we're commanded to. And, and it's, so let's, let's be doing that. Uh, I love this quote from Martin Luther. He says, come, let us sing a psalm and drive away the devil. <laughs> I love that. Okay, you feel under spiritual attack? You get out one of these psalms and you just start singing it. You just pull it out and start singing it. Um, verse 6. It talks about a, the stupid person or the senseless person doesn't know. The fool doesn't understand it. Though the wicked sprout like grass and evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. Okay, so it looks like the, uh, so often in our world that the evil people are getting the upper hand. No, they're not. That's all temporary. Verse 8, but you, O Lord, are on high forever. And his enemies are coming down. Verse 11 says, My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. Victory is promised. Victory is assured for the people of God. Romans 8, 37 says that in Christ we are more than conquerors. And then we flip to Revelation and we see who wins, right? And you've got the choice of being on the winning team. So uh, trust Jesus and you don't have to worry about long-term battles being lost. You know that we are on the victorious team. Then in verses 12 through 15, we see how the righteous flourish and thrive. It says the righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now the palm and the cedars... Uh, are trees that you will see in Israel, and they symbolize permanence because they last and grow forever, and strength. So uh, he goes on to say, they are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age, and they are ever full of sap and green. Now, again... How many of you want to, uh, you're going to be living long, you want every day to count? How many of you want to be fruitful and productive till the very end? Okay, so, so uh, you don't want to be that old dried up branch, do you? That, you know, you break it and it's just like, no. 
You want to have that green sap running through your veins. <laughs> you, you want to be still thriving till the end, producing fruit. So be planted in the house of the Lord. Verse um, 20 says, To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in him. And the Old Testament tells us there's no unrighteousness in him. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was sinless. In fact, uh, Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he was tempted in every way like we are, yet he sinned not. He is sinless. And there are other places that say that as well. Psalm 93. The majesty of God... Anonymous. This is a royal hymn. And from 93 through 100, these are all going to be royal hymns except for 94. And I wish they had just put it first so we could have that straight run. <laughs> well, we're going to have 93 and then 94 and then back to royal hymns. Because so, these are just de dedicated to celebrating the sovereignty of God's kingship over the entire world. Verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. His throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. And so again, this is speaking of the uh, royal authority, the kingship of God. Sometimes these royal uh, psalms are about the 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 human king on the earth and, and giving him guidance and counsel and help. Uh, sometimes they're pointing ahead to the Messiah coming. But sometimes in this, it's like, it, it, it's God. You are king, you are robed in majesty, and you have been established from everlasting. Talks about his, how the floods and the waters speak of him, and the, even the waves uh, speak of the Lord on high and how mighty he is. Verse 5 says, Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. So this is a, a short psalm, but it is the confident, proven experience of this psalmist who, has, who, who knows and understands that God can be trusted. He knows it from experience, he knows it from reading it, and he knows that God is good. Psalm 94, okay, now we're switching gears, okay. Uh, vengeance belongs only to God, it's anonymous, and it's impre an imprecatory uh, psalm. Um, Begins, O oh Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O oh judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. Now, this may be one of the most strongly worded of the imprecatory psalms. And if you're new and following us, imprecatory means they are calling on God to go get their enemies. I call them the go get them God psalms because that's what they're asking. And um, so this psalmist is, uh, there's some oppression, the wicked are prospering, and he's saying, God, you know, repay them, repay the proud. Um, he sees, uh, he, he begins with this simple, you know, request and recognition that God is the one who, uh, that vengeance belongs to him. In fact, God says that. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Um, it means that God will judge righteously. Uh, vengeance is not the same as revenge. Revenge is more like a human passion that we have. Vengeance belongs to the one, the one, who sees more than we can see. You know, I can only see right now this room and the foyer and a little bit of the parking lot, I can't see what's behind me or in these other buildings or what's going on at home or around the world. God sees everything. So in that, he can justly see everything. So vengeance is, to, is his, the one who can see everything and who knows and understands everything. So... Uh, 
he is the Lord of retributive justice. He knows what is fair and just. In this world, we don't always know, do we? We don't have the full picture. God does. So he's asking for vengeance. And then uh, verse 3, it says, O oh Lord, how long shall the wicked... How long shall the wicked exalt? In other words, be exalted. How long are they going to prosper? How long? And we see that pop up a few times in other psalms. How long? And we see it in Revelation. And this is in the middle of the tribulation period, it's thought, where there are all kinds of things happening destructively here on the earth before the return of Christ. Revelation 6, 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar uh, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So these are the martyrs who are in heaven. There it it's describes them as being underneath the altar. Their souls are there. They've been slain. They've been martyred for the word of God, it says. And they're there and they're going, how long? How long is this going to last before you take vengeance on our blood for those who are dwelling on earth? And God doesn't answer them, and he doesn't answer in Psalms, but because we know that he is righteous and just, we know it will be taken care of in his perfect timing. Back to Psalm 94, verse 22, it says, But the Lord has become my stronghold and my rock, uh, my God and my rock of the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and will wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. Uh, Psalm 95. In, uh, in this psalm, we're back to... Uh, Good times, okay? <laughs> we call this one, Call to Worship the Lord. It's anonymous. It's another praise and royal psalm. And it begins <clears throat> saying, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So again, it's telling us, let's sing, let's sing. Does, does it say, let's sing if you've got a pretty voice? No, it says, make a joyful noise. And that's how some of us sound. It's joyful, but it's kind of noise. It's kind of like noise, yeah. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. We have Tricia to lead us, you know. She's got the good voice. We can just fill in, right? And there's several of you in here that have great voices, and I love to hear you sing, so belt it out in here. And um, I will make my joyful noise. Uh, verse 3, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. For in his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So people need to praise him, but it's talking about all of creation here. And it says, And then, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. So worshiping and bow, bowing down were so common in the Hebrews' days, days and uh, not as common today in many churches. I love the fact that this church has these altars up front with these nice padded knee pads because it's so easy and comfortable to just come and bow down to kneel and pray here. And I know for some of you, you're like going... Yeah, but isn't that a Methodist or a Catholic thing or something? No, it's a Bible thing. 
it's a Bible thing. And, you know, I, I know being brought up Baptist, we didn't have this. And I, one of the things I love about this church is that it does have it, that there is a place to come up and kneel and pray. And so I, I do that every week before, before I get up here. I, I kneel and pray. And often I kneel and pray when there's nobody in here. Can you kneel and pray at home? Absolutely. Of course. Of course you can. But it's nice to do it in, in the house of the Lord. It's nice to be able to worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our maker. Now these uh, verses that are coming up here, 7 through 11, are quoted in Hebrews chapter 3, verses uh 7 through 11. Same 7 and 11 here, 7 and 11 there. Okay? Let's read these. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah on the day at Massa in the wilderness when they, yeah, defied God, grumbled. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Strong statement there. They've tested me in the wilderness, so he's given their history of when they were wandering in the wilderness, complaining and and saying over and over, well, God, can you do this? Can you do that? You know, it, there weren't enough miracles to go around as far as they were concerned. Um, but to know God is to trust God. When we truly know God, it's easy to trust him. If you truly know him, you can trust him. Unbelief is the result of not really knowing trust in God. It's, it's evidence of a small, faulty amount of knowledge of God. Verse 11 says, Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God in the wilderness said, Okay, this generation, uh-uh, that's it. One too many complaints. They are not going to the promised land. They had the opportunity Sent the 12 spies. Ten came back and said, no, we can't do it. Two, Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. But the people didn't listen to God and to the two uh, who said, if God's on our side, we can do anything. We can take that, uh, those, uh, you know, people at Jericho, the Canaanites. But no, so God said, they are not going to enter my rest. God did not honor their unbelief. You know, sometimes we're like, well, why didn't God let them, I mean, 40 years, why didn't he let them go in? Because of their unbelief. You think God is going to uh, honor our unbelief? Is he going to go, oh, you're fine? No. In fact, that unbelief was an insult to God, and it still is, and it prompted this declaration that this generation isn't going in. But it will be your, uh, the next generation of faithful believers who are going to inherit the promised land, the appointed place of rest for his people. Charles Spurgeon says this, There can be no rest for an unbelieving heart. If manna and miracles could not satisfy Israel, neither uh, would they have been content with the land that flowed with milk and honey. There are many people today who are still failing to enter into the rest that God is offering us, and it's because of unbelief. He's offering us rest. Your Christian experience is at times like a wilderness experience. And... Uh, you haven't really entered into that full rest in him yet, but God wants you to have rest in this world, peace. So he's saying to us today too, today, today if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. 
if you hear his voice, and maybe his voice is saying, hey, I want you to do this. I'd like for you to step out and take this assignment. I'd like for you to talk to this person. I'd like for you to go back to church. I'd like for you to do this. And we say, no. And every time we say no to God, the next time it gets a little bit easier to say no. And a little easier. And a little easier. And with each no, our hearts get harder. And so we need to listen to his word. Today, today, if God, if you're listening, if you hear God speaking to you today, do not harden your heart. Say, yes, Lord, yes. Psalm 96, declare the glory of God. Uh, this is an anonymous psalm. It's a royal praise psalm. It has a parallel song found in 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 33. It's almost identical. That one is attributed to David, so this is kind of anonymously. Okay, it's David or someone who liked it and put it, wrote it for him and stuck it in the book here. Um, it's an awesome song of praise uh, to the Lord of all people, all nations, and all creation. Verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. So that second verse is saying, Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation every day. Every day, sing every day, bless his name, may I tell of his salvation. Yes, in other words, this should be a pattern of our daily living. Declare his, work, his glory among the nations for his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But God made the heavens. So he's saying... Um, there's other gods out there, and they had names in the ancient world, and there are still some today, but that they're nothing. They were created by the minds and idols by the hands of people. They're not real. They're not real, but God is the one who's to be feared. He's the one who made the heavens, it says. And so don't worship those. And you say, yeah, well, that was ancient days. But yet we worship the gods of our days, whether it's materialism, whether it's a sports team. Some of the people who are the quietest in church are the loudest in a stadium. <laughs> yeah, because they're worshiping the God there. That temple doesn't have any trouble filling up on Sundays. Yeah, think about it. We need to be really worshiping the one true God, I have nothing against sports. I love sports, and I will go in and be, be loud. But I'm also going to be singing and praising God when I'm in the house of the Lord. This is God's temple, and it's so much better than any stadium or arena or whatever. Splendor and majesty, verse 6, are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Verse 8, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the, Lord, the world is established. It will, shall not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And, and, and then it goes on to talk about how the, how the heavens are glad, the earth rejoices, the sea roars, the field exults, the trees of the forest sing for joy. And then before the Lord, uh, for he comes to judge, and he will judge in righteousness and in his faithfulness. Psalm 97, another royal praise song, Rejoice! The Lord reigns. This is anonymous. It's a royal psalm. And it continues this same theme and tone as the previous ones. Um, uh, hailing God's might and power in the coming king. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. And it talks about the clouds. And it talks about the fire and the lightnings. 
and the mountains and the heavens again proclaiming and that the worshipers of the false gods and idols are going to be put to shame. Um, verse 10 says, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. And so often we don't, we don't realize this is a command from God to hate evil. Now we're not supposed to hate people, but the evil, we are not to snuggle up close to it like we tend to do and go, well, that wasn't so bad. Well, that's not so, you know, I'm not going to even, you know, worry about that. That's nothing. If it's evil, God says, hate it. Don't love it. Don't condone it. Don't allow it in your house. It goes on to say he preserves the life, lives of his saints and he delivers them from the wicked. But is he going to deliver you from the wicked if you're snuggled up next to evil? Verse 9, light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Give thanks to his holy name. So again, his name is holy. We need to treat his name like a holy name. You know, the Jewish people will not even speak the name of God. They say Hashem, which means the name. They reverence it that much, and yet we use it like, at times like a slang word. Shouldn't happen. Psalm 98, sing a new song to the Lord. Anonymous hymn, that's another royal praise song. Uh, this may have been written on the occasion of some national triumph at the time. Uh, <clears throat> and it begins again, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. I mean, again, are you hearing this? I, and I keep having songs pop in my head like, Sing, sing a song. Sing out loud. Sing out strong. Sing of good times, not bad. Anyway. Um, we are a people made to love music and to sing music and to glorify God with that music. It says, He has done marvelous things, and His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. Um, verse 4 Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord. Again, bring in the instruments, it says, and bring in the trumpets and the horn and make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills uh, sing for joy together. I listen to this, the people, the instruments, even nature, and I think, and let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Uh, before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Now, in the ancient world, justice was rare. And you can look around the world today and see that in many places, justice is still rare. Uh, Judges in those days were bribed by money or political power, ideology, um, prejudice. And we still see that in the world today. God is just, though, and justice is coming. God will handle this world and all who are in it with equity. His retributive justice will come to those who have done evil and rewards to those who have done well. As we uh, close today, I want to close with a word from Paul in Romans 15, 4. Because we've been reading all this new, I mean, Old Testament stuff. Why are we reading it? Why are we studying this? Why do we need to know this? Because aren't we New Testament believers? Yeah. But we are also Old Testament believers. And Paul writes this. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now when Paul wrote this about the endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, 
none of the New Testament had been written yet. We didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe one of them had been written, timeline-wise. But they sure weren't canonized. They sure weren't being uh, part of a book yet. So they weren't considered scriptures until much later. So when he says what was written in former days, he's talking about the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And he's telling New Testament Christians that that was written for our instruction. It's written for our uh, encouragement. It's written for our good, basically. So that's why we study the old and the new. You are going to understand the New Testament so much better when we get there because you have studied through the Old Testament. It will make so much more sense as we tie it all together. Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word, which is living and powerful. Your word, which instructs us in the old and in the new. Lord, today, help us not to harden our hearts, but to open our ears to what you are asking us to do and how you're asking us to live and serve and love. Lord, may we daily sing of your goodness. May we... Thank you daily and praise you often. Lord, you deserve all the glory because you are the only good and just one. You are the only perfect one, and we love you. If there is anyone here today who maybe you're speaking to them um, not just about what you might like them to do in this world, but what you want them to be, like to be a child of God, and maybe today you're knocking on the door of their heart and saying, Lord, it's time that you put your faith and trust in my son Jesus. Lord, I pray that they will believe and receive him into their hearts, that today they will not harden their hearts, but will open wide the door of their heart and invite your son in. And it is in his name, Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.